still, as a teenager, having an opportunity to sign a recording contract. What was that like as a teenager, knowing that your dreams were coming true within the music industry? It was just extraordinary. And I just prayed a lot. I just did a lot of thanking of God because I knew so many people that were at least as worthy as me, if not more so, of those sort of things happening to them. And uh, yet it was happening to me. So I think that might have been part of why I was so heavy into doing things for charity and other people, because I feel like I just got lucky. <laughs> Welcome to Cool Life Podcast, brought to you by TheRealThingDating.com www.therealthingdating.com Polydor Records for out scouting. This girl grabbed my bangs oh. and ran my head right to the speaker. Oh. And everyone here like this, yeah. When we shot the scene in Goodwill Hunting, I didn't know who most of these people were at the time. I mean, they weren't stars. It was Gus Van Sant that, that directed it. Gus Van Sant was on the floor with Matt Damon's Will character. Hunting. I didn't even know who Matt Damon was at that time. I'm Eva John. I'm a former candidate for local government. I was a children's television entertainer, and I love this world, and I believe we should take care of each other and have a lot of fun along the way. Welcome to Cool Life. Here we go. <laughs> In this episode of Cool Life Podcast, we get to enjoy Mr. Paris Black's emotional performance of the song Completely, written by the late Kenny McLean. Paris Black performs this song at the memorial event for Mr. McLean, and he's introduced by Much Music video jockey, Mr. Steve Anthony. We also get to enjoy Paris Black's performance of Take Me Home from his CD, I'm Not Jesus. Trigger warning, after the second commercial break, there is some discussion of self-harm. And now, please enjoy part one of my conversation with Mr. Paris Black on Cool Life Podcast. And welcome to Cool Life Podcast. I'm Eva John, and today we have a very special treat. We have the great Paris Black, singer, songwriter, recording artist, child prodigy artist, model, art model, and also the doorway for many other artists to have their art seen throughout the world. Such generosity, the instigator of a youth charity, and I'm so honored to have you on Cool Life Podcast, parents. Well, Eva, the honor's mine. Um... What you don't know is Eva was my manager for a few years, and she did wondrous things. We had a wonderful show at Hamilton Place that she really sweated blood to get done. And a uh, wonderful show at the Mod Club, actually, that just that some of the best footage I've ever gotten from that show, as well as getting me started in figure modeling, so which has been my you know, bread and butter for 15 years or so, and it's taken me around the world, so... I have much to be thankful to Eva John for. Well, it always has been a privilege and a pleasure to work with you, Paris. And, you know, it's amazing to work with so much talent as you have, and you always made it very, very easy. So uh, I was so glad to work with you. And thank you. <laughs> I'm going to ask if you could please state your website. ParisBlackOfficial.com. Thank you. I'm glad that you are here, and I'm glad that we have a chance to have more than just a passing conversation for a lot of other people who are aware of you, but maybe aren't aware of some of the many different aspects to what a gifted artist you are. And there is a point in your life where you were acknowledged and recognized as a child 
prodigy artist. And can you tell me, how did you first step into the world of art? Actually, um, I would say, you know, it, it kind of found me. I was in a lot of foster homes and different situations and um, drawing and painting, having your own little world was something that really drew me, um, drew, drew me in and I drew the world. Um, yeah, I had a lot of time to do that stuff. And uh, it, it was, and, and, you know, I became, I would, I would, a lot of my stuff was, was figurative work. And I'd be, I would, had such heroes like, you know, Muhammad Ali and, and, uh, and Joe Frazier at the time and George Foreman. And I liked a lot of boxers when I was a kid and uh, George Chevallo and all this. So I, these are the people that I painted to begin with. And, um, but again, I was just a kid. And uh, I had some initial success in that. But um, once I found sports and show business, it kind of drifted away because my, you know, I just recently, I'm going to share this, I just recently was diagnosed with ADHD. Oh. And this was one reason why it took me, uh, you know, I don't know when you know we were working together, it would take me a long time to, to learn my own lyrics and, and all that. And that was because I was, was thinking about a million things at once. Mm -hmm. thinking about somebody in the first row why do they look upset or somebody over there or somebody there or what and i wouldn't be you know hunkering down to what i was doing so when i got a taste of other things i sort of my personality was more outgoing than introverted so i became um, more into the other stuff but i still love art and uh, i'm sure one day i'll return to it for sure i mean it's it's almost a foregone conclusion because Being around such great artists while in figure modeling certainly is an inspiration to get back at it myself. Although, you know, other things are still ahead of it. Hmm. But again, I did win the Rotary Club Artist of the Year and I did uh, get my hmm. stuff shown at uh, AGO when I was in high school. So, you know, those were nice things to happen. And, uh, You know, they're so long ago, I almost forget about them, and I'm glad you brought them up. Well, I mean, they're very special things to happen uh, for a young person, however creative. Usually, mm -hmm. there aren't children, teenagers who are getting their artwork put into the AGO, right? I was fortunate. Yeah. And, and I, I always uh, say, by the grace of God, everything happens, you know. Right. Well, it certainly happened for you. And I mean, the great galleries around the world had your artwork and that recognition at a very young age is something special. I realized that as you were experiencing it, it just seems like, well, that's what happened next. But for the rest of the world on the outside, knowing that's not what usually happens with a young person's artwork to get that recognition means there's something there. And that's pretty special. And I wonder, as a gifted youth artist, child prodigy, did you have any sense of where your inspiration came from? Um, it's an interesting question. I, I People ask me that about music and other things, but never about art. Uh, uh, I think it was that I was such a fan of people. Um, at one time, um, a guy named, um, Peter Cooks was working on a session with me and he was doing a dance version of something else and the Hold On Tight project, he was on that. And so, um, he was from, he was from South Africa mm -hmm. and he knew Nelson Mandela. So I said, if I did a really awesome portrait of Nelson Mandela, could you, get it to him and he said definitely he could because he worked with Johnny Clegg and other people that you know he knew Nelson Mandela mm -hmm. so I did like probably my best my best drawing anyway of him and and another artist that I know uh, Kathy Young who's a singer um let me know that she did in fact see it in the great man's house so a lot of I I think it was the same as when I did impersonations of people um that I drew people and painted people and impersonated people that I admired. Mm -hmm. And you kind of 
kind of suck their essence out when you just see them in a certain way and feel how they move and talk and all of that. And you cut, you know, you learn from them. So, um, like everybody that I was painting and drawing, I think would have attributes that then maybe I thought I was lacking or that I wanted to bring out more in myself and wanted to kind of, you know, I do that with, um, with musicians for sure, where I would work with somebody that I think is better at something than me, or a lot of things, a lot of people are a lot better at things than me, but I'm just saying that um, when somebody- I think I can agree. I'm not gonna let you get away with saying that. No. Well, thanks, but I, I, so I would, you know, work with somebody that I like the quality of their voice perhaps and write with them and sort of see where it's all coming from, how they're moving, how their, their head's going and, you know, how everything, how do they get those particular notes in such a way as they got them or how somebody moves or um, how somebody writes, you know, whatever it is, I've always felt that it's really good to interact with the best people if possible. And, um, you know, don't compete with them, learn from them, take, you know, just, just go with it. And uh, you'll come out the other side better off. So with art, yeah, it was, it was figurative art. It was it was? I mean, I would say Leroy Neyman because he used to do, do a lot of boxers. Mm -hmm. um, of course, everybody does studies of the of sort of the classical arts, and that was part of you know I, what I did. But uh, it was really something I. I just, I just needed an outlet, and it was the first one I found where people said, "Oh, you're so great at that." And when you hear that, and you're like, you know, living in foster homes or whatever, uh, you know, you don't often hear that. You know, you kind of think of yourself as sort of less than. So, mm -hmm. um, it was, you know, really. Um, it, it was just something I, you know, I, I fell into the same way I fell into it being the class clown and doing impersonations. And, um, when I found out I was good at certain sports then I did those, you know, a lot more. And, uh, you know, if you don't have necessarily a family or a foundation at home, you're liable to check for it other places. And I think that's probably what I did. I sort of protected it from different parts of the world and made my, made myself, feel worthy maybe of being loved or something by trying to be good at things you know it's something that is in the heart of every child and every adult had their moment of being a child and it's amazing that you turned that feeling into something active and turned it into something that could be shared with other people it's definitely a very special gift and it's wonderful that you left a mark on the world of art. We're taking a break. So please feel free to write us at info at coollifeworld.com with your comments. Keep them clean and we'll read them on another show. That's info at coollifeworld.com. We're going to talk about our sponsors and supporters and we'll be back with more talk with Paris Black on Cool Life Podcast. Uh, bring up on this here stage, if I could, uh, a, a gentleman who I like a whole lot, uh, except for the fact that my wife has posters of him in her bedroom above our bed. <laughs> Am I not lying? Because I've never lied. Here to give me a hug and crush me to death before he sings the title track completely, Paris Black. Please don't hesitate. 
Those lonely days of lockdowns and isolation are gone for good. Go to www.therealthingdating.com. That's www.therealthingdating.com. It's time to share. Share your time, share your life, share your love. www.therealthingdating.com. Join for free. Upgrade at any time, starting at just $5.99 a month. www.therealthingdating.com Because it's time. You're listening to The Cool Life Podcast. We'll be back in 3, 2, 1. And we're back on Cool Life Podcast. I'm Eva John, continuing our conversation with Paris Black. Now, in the world of art, you eventually transitioned to the world of modeling. You had worldwide recognition as an artist. And with a lot of attention on you, you also got attention of people who made offers for you to go into modeling. How did you perceive that change from being focused on being an artist to a working model. Well, there was, I've got to say, there was a big piece in between that. There was a big piece in between that. So, yeah, I was an artist. That's how everybody knew me. And then um, a couple of things happened. One of them was that uh, my sister died when I was very young, was a little bit messed up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up coming to Canada coming to Canada uh she died here but but I ended up going to boxing gyms and you know people like George Chevallo and Spider Jones and you know Clyde Gray and my stepdad Arnold Paris you know worked in these environments and I sort of fell into that world and I liked being good at something again and again getting, you know, sort of people to like you or respect you or whatever. And I was a, I was a really odd kid in school and I dressed really weird. And um, so learning boxing was good for me. And then I found out I was good at track and I got a, a scholarship offer to me. So I have a problem with lifelong insomnia. And I was having to get up early all the time for these track meets or for these boxing matches and training every single day. And I just never liked it. I mean, it wasn't that I, I didn't like it. It's that I just couldn't fall asleep between, you know, before like three or four. So if I'm going to, you know, getting up at five, it was just never any sleep. Mm -hmm. So at the same time as I had an athletic scholarship offered to me, I was also getting interest. I I was doing uh, impersonations and voiceovers on radio. And so I went to New York to be either a a you know a boxer or a comedian like wow <laughs> so so I went there and I did you know I, I spent sixty five dollars on a shirt and this is this is like a hundred years ago so like right. sixty for that shirt would be like four hundred dollars today mm -hmm. uh, and I had like one hundred and fifty dollars I spent more than half my my money on this shirt because I was going to go and catch a rising star that night okay. And I was sure when I came off the stage, after having doing all my impersonations, that I was going to just be all of a sudden be like, you know, Richard Pryor, he'll be offering me, you know, contracts and, you know. Okay, right. So I did I did well, but they said, okay, well, you know, come back next week and just keep coming back here on the advertising. I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I, I already thought this was going to happen. Right. I was like 16 years old. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just got really lucky, really. I was just wandering around didn't really know where I was going to stay or anything and this sort of it might have been a cult or something I can't don't really know remember a lot about it but there's a group of people asked me to come and stay with them inside and I was okay. you know it was like November or something or early December maybe or late November whatever and I was like okay sure definitely so I went in and they had like donuts and coffee and everything and they had like you know like pillows you would go to sleep there and um now, in my memory banks, it seems like the next day I went out and I got scouted by Wilhelmina Modeling Agency, but I don't know whether that's exactly how quickly it happened. Uh, mm -hmm. I might have might have been there for a little while longer than that. I just can't remember. But to me, I got scouted by an agency. And um, 
so I started the modeling. Well, and that's a pretty big name in modeling, William yeah, was, was Agency. Big, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like that was one of the biggest names, yeah, it was really and big. they were recognized with having the top models in North America and in Europe. Mm -hmm. Well, I was fortunate to get in there. Yeah, and um, I got with a few other agencies when I came back to Toronto. So that part of my life had changed a lot. So now, before, for me to get recognition, it would be maybe going into a boxing match and winning, hurting somebody and probably getting hurt. Mm -hmm. And um, when, the, when that sort of changed into uh, being a model and being with pretty girls, you know, or uh, when I got into more musical things and uh, was becoming a teen idol and it just seemed like the stupidest thing in the world to walk towards the electric chair there and have somebody you know beat on please, you so, please hit me yeah so <laughs> you know i i i lost my interest in that life for me not that i lost my interest in in the sport but i lost right. my interest in, in that in that life for me and um so the transition wasn't quite as stark because uh I started, you know, I got I got into modeling really by luck, and it was just completely luck. And then um, I came back to Toronto and joined a couple of other agencies here. And what happened next was that a friend's band asked me, John Bianchini's band, um, and uh, Roger Banks and those guys, and uh, uh, fashion, and these guys, so. They asked me to join their band just for one night. They were playing at the um, Rock and Roll Heaven at Young and Bloor. Right. And I well went known up, place. Yeah, and I went up and I just did a bunch of impersonations of singers. So that was part of my repertoire at the time of impersonations was doing singers. And um, the place really, I did really great with it. It would, went over so well that, and this sounds super incredible, and I. I feel like it's exactly how it happened. There was two guys in the audience that were related to Austin's Modeling, which was a firm, and I was also involved with them. So it was Gary Griselli out of Detroit and Bob Parr out of Toronto. And uh, Bob Parr did you know, the heavy lifting in getting my career started. Uh, got me to um, do vocal lessons with Elaine Overholt and uh, did dance lessons every day. Did you know all the all the stuff that people did back then, and um, so transitioning to a performer was I'd become. See, after getting my attention through art, I realized that by being able to impersonate teachers and be funny in class, that I was going to get more popular too. I think I think I had had a f weird relationship with popularity. On the one hand, I would sabotage myself by, like, because I would go and visit my, like, I was born in Denmark, and I lived in England until I was 10, then I came here. I would go visit my grandparents in the summer, and I would come, you know, back with, you know, clothes from Carnaby Streets and, and all of this stuff, and I was really didn't look normal for Scarborough. So right. I kind of, I kind of, you know, goat footed myself this way. But at the same time, then then it kind of got out that I was like, you know, boxing champion and then uh, my artwork was showing all the time places. And, um, and then I sort of thought, OK, so the class clown and stuff it was all going, you know, swimmingly well of making me forget my unhappy home life and making me really love my school social life, I guess, really, and the sports and all of these different different families and communities that brought came, came in. But when the um, opportunity came and it really happened like this. It just came um, for me to be a singer. Um, at that time, at that time in history, being a singer was a really good way to talk about things that you want to talk about and uh, help people out because I was really involved with helping other people out because I'd been on the street myself and then all of a sudden now I had tons of money. So... I started with Marilyn Bellier, uh, a charity called Chill Out, which ended up growing to Project Warmth and then Project Jobs, and uh, now it's Raise the Roof. So, 
and that's no small thing. You just say it like it's a bunch of words, but well, I mean, you, know, it, it, it you changed and, lives. You changed lives. Well, I, you know, I don't know if I did that much. I thought I did a lot. I was, I was, I mean, I've had a little bit of a Jesus complex or something because I spent an awful lot of my money. I spent like all my money <laughs> um, uh, that I had made because I thought that I thought that homelessness was just an oversight. There's somehow people you know, would never want anybody to be homeless. So, you know, if you just got the people the stuff and, you know, you could get them into, into empty apartments and stuff, it would be all fixed. And um, I took the tab myself. Like, I mean, I, 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 I paid for this. You know, the reality set in later that that's not anybody's first issue in Toronto. Um, even this is like, this is like 30 years ago when I started it uh, with Marilyn Bellier. Um, and um, now, I mean, you know, it's just so out of control, but we can see that nobody really cares. So I I probably would have been better off to spend my time and effort doing something else for people than that. But I'm I going to say I, I don't agree. Like, I don't agree. I, I know that your program that you conceived of, you financed, you made it happen, and it was done so well that the city of Toronto wanted to take it over because it didn't make did. sense for them to try to make their own separate parallel system that didn't work when you had one that was working and well, I gotta I gotta say and I've got to I've really got to uh, thank other people like I mean, Marilyn Bellier actually started the whole thing and I picked it up when she was you know she was the lady working in the projects living in the projects and she was like fighting drug dealers off of her balcony and stuff and wow. really quite a hero. And so, you know, she brought me into it and I did, you know, make it very much of my focus for about 13 years. And, you know, she got us involved with bingos and stuff like that. And I got us people like Tom Jacobic and, um, well, Ed Mervish was the main guy that helped at the beginning because I used to play his names. shows at his birthday. Yeah, he was fantastic. Yeah. Ed Ed Mervish actually just gave me a big part of the store. This, this is the first time, I think, that people were like sorting like all kinds of clothes and things like when we had expensive sponsors and um, like they were getting like brand new stuff and Jagger Gordon's doing it now, and Daniel Lauzon is really hands-on. He's out there, mm -hmm. um, Daniel Lauzon, bringing people uh, things in horrible situations that they're in now. So, I mean, the battle goes on, yes. you know, but the battle isn't going to be won until we have some sort of common sense, like they have in Norway, where, you know, you're not allowed to be homeless, basically. Right. Because they're only really homeless in a cold place if they're mentally ill or so, you know, down on their luck or Ill, or just, just like, it just shouldn't happen, obviously. You know, people need a home, home over their head. And whatever. Right. Anyway, I've talked enough. Sorry. No, absolutely not. You haven't. And, and this is a very, very big thing you did. You were so far ahead of your time in having a, a program like this, which is still alive today because of your drive and your determination to make a difference in people's lives, and which you did. And you're right, there is a difference between how programs like this are run in North America and how they're run in Scandinavia. Uh, here, there's always, for some reason, a kind of righteousness platform where in order to have access to housing and other programs, if you have other types of issues, such as addictions and, and mental health issues, there's a requirement pretty much that you address the addiction and mental health before you can actually have access to the housing. In Scandinavia, there are many different programs, different cities where they get you the home and then they work on other issues like addiction, mental health issues. So the idea that you can heal yourself from a home is a little bit better than the idea that heal yourself and then you get a home which is what still happens here, which uh, you know, maybe we could see that one model uh, might be more effective than the other, but your drive made a big difference, really. Well, I just, I, you know, whatever, whatever positive I brought, I'm just grateful that I did. And I'm grateful to God that, you know, I was able to, 
Um, how successful it was ultimately, that's w whatever. But um, I, you know, I tried, and um, I think if people try, it's really great. But also, people should be maybe a little more enlightened, not just go barreling into things. Be a little more enlightened about, you know, uh the adversities that are out there when you're trying to help people actually there's a fair amount there's really a fair amount because um people are well pe people need to be informed i guess is all it is well the ability to be informed is there at our fingertips these days right even more so than when you started your charity and you know there is a there is a certain attitude and mindset uh, that more charitable nature of humans could be brought out, I think, even more. And if only by being enforced or by having more excellent examples like yourself. And uh, you, I'm glad um, I'm glad you did what you did to have chill out become something so much bigger. Well, I appreciate that. Um, it would really be great if everybody just had a home and a safe place and a door to shut. Uh, that would be, that's what we you know. That's one of the main things I think right. that we need. Every person needs. It's like, it, it's a, it's a, to me, it's a human right. So, yes. um, but you know, it's a much bigger problem now. So, um, it, it's a very it's a complicated issue to solve. I I didn't realize how complicated it was. Now I know a little better. But I think your youthful determination is the kind of thing where if you'd stop to think about it more, or maybe inactivity wouldn't have helped as much as your activity in turning this into a real thing. Well, now, thank you. definitely, thank you for all that you've done in the area of charities. For sure, yeah. Right now, we're going to take a break. We're going to talk about our sponsors and supporters, and then we're going to be back with more talent and music talk with Paris Black on Cool Life Podcast. Like a story to unfold Tell me your name What's going on? You're looking hot but feeling so damn cold Is it a game? Been here before Let me take you in my arms Release your child's play Baby, rest your heart
Those lonely days of lockdowns and isolation are gone for good. Go to www.therealthingdating.com. That's www.therealthingdating.com. It's time to share. Share your time, share your life, share your love. www.therealthingdating.com. Join for free. Upgrade at any time, starting at just $5.99 a month. www.therealthingdating.com Because it's time. This is Cool Life Podcast. Please remember to subscribe to Cool Life on your streaming service and on YouTube as Hellenique Today. That's H-E-L-E-N-I-Q-U-E Today. Because that helps us to bring more cool stuff to your ears. You're listening to The Cool Life Podcast. We'll be right back. And we're back. From the world of modeling, you had opportunities that came to you you got recognition and you know the kind of training that maybe we wish as you've described we may wish that many other artists coming up would actually be trained in voice would actually be trained in dance and not necessarily have some of the i'd say there are times you find kind of a a haphazard uh, representation of talent and i think good talent is always easy to recognize. It doesn't need a definition. It stops you where you are. And when you cultivate that talent and grow that talent, you really do make something that could be far more long-term, something that can continue to to enrich our culture, our society. I think it's really important what artists do because as much as we people do need a roof over their head, we do need food in our stomachs, but there's something special about humans because we are creative and that exists in you and things that maybe other people aren't able to do somewhere inside us, we can recognize that you're doing what we wish we could do and what we admire. And when those opportunities continue to arrive at your doorstep and people wanted to let you have that chance to become a musician at you know, still as a teenager, having an opportunity to sign a recording contract and to not just dream or hope that you could tag along with a band, but to be the driving force and the reason people were buying tickets. For you, what was that like as a teenager, knowing that your dreams were coming true within the music industry? It was just extraordinary. And I just prayed a lot. I just did a lot of thanking of God because I knew so many people that were at least as worthy as me, if not more so, of those sort of things happening to them. And uh, yet it was happening to me. So I think that might have been part of why I was so heavy into doing things for charity and other people because I feel like I just got lucky, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was wonderful. And I was so... For a kid that had been starting as low as I had to see myself in billboards and magazine covers and all of this was, you know, overwhelming. I started identifying with that person more than the other person that I had been, which was actually a good thing because I wanted to leave that person behind. with all the uh, sadness and insecurities and all of that. So it was a really, it it was a great thing. But again, I never forgot how lucky I was that it was happening at all. 
And when I lost my first record contract, I was literally going to drown myself in the, uh, um, in the round Cozumel. So I lost my contract. I went to Cozumel. It was like late November and the sun went down early and, uh, I swam out in the ocean and, uh, I was on there like 16 hours or something with the intention of drowning myself. Oh my but once I was out there and it was dark and I couldn't, didn't know where I was going. And oh my God, it was terrifying, just terrifying. And I was just like floating all night to like to see the lights come on in the morning. And I knew where to get back. Oh my goodness. And um, there's something here that sounds a little, a little maybe too much for some people, but so I had this silver cross and um, I had just kept praying that I wasn't going to get eaten by something or drowned, you know, and the, you know, the water, the, the where the water's pretty calm around there. So it wasn't like waves too much, but uh, I was worried. And um, so just a little further along, all of a sudden, like maybe a couple hours later, my cross came off. And a school of barracudas chased it down to the bottom of the ocean. So it means there was a school of barracudas around me that I didn't know about. You didn't you see know. them. Oh. So, um, like, and you know, you hear you know bigger fish coming up, and it was scary, really scary. Right. But I got you know I got into the land, and I and I, you know, asked God to forgive me for trying to kill myself. And I was lucky enough that I got another record deal right away, like literally days later. Um, Morris Felinosi called me from uh, Isba Sony in Montreal. And uh, so I started my second um, LP. Now, I, now let me just it. note here that you did say the word Sony. Okay. Just don't, yeah. you just like, oh, 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 Sony. CBS, Sony. Blah, 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 blah. CBS, it became Sony. It became Sony later. It was yeah. CBS. Then, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. blah, 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 blah. So Sony. Yes. Dude, nice, but the thing about it is, the thing about it is, though. Big stuff, um, man. Oh, thank you. Uh, the thing about it is, though. But in those days, it was a much bigger thing um, because like very few people like now, you you know, you know, every one of your friends has got a CD out. You know, everybody's got a CD out, 10 CDs. Out. But in those days, things was on, on vinyl and extremely expensive to do. Right. And there was a process where you did. First of all, you did demo tapes and uh, you'd had, you know, you had uh, to do shows for them, for the for the possible people that would sign you. You give them your demo. On the strength of that demo, they would come to see you live. And on the strength of you being live and having great songs and a great demo, they would sign you and put a lot of money into you. So there was a really, there was a way to do it then. And I think it was actually easier then. Um, because now... I mean, anybody can put out a CD. Anybody can put something up. Anybody can do this and do that. And they can do other. But um, there's just such a glut. It's like cardboard Cadillacs in a parking lot, and um, you know, one real Cadillac, and mm -hmm. it's hard to see when there's all these, you know, demos around rather than the finished product. And that's right. what people are putting mainly demos. Right. Um, right. And at that time, um, once you got that happening if let's say your album sold for twelve dollars or ten dollars and was on sale or something like that um you'd get in your pocket for sure one dollar so each sale you get one dollar the store um would get probably two dollars probably the label got a few dollars or got a couple of dollars i'm not sure of all the the statistics but i do know that the artist would wind up with about 10%. Nowadays, artists selling a million units are getting $2,000 for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though it's just like downloads, I mean, the the way it is now, it's pretty much impossible. And so the, the impetus to do great work isn't really there because the money is not really there. Mm -hmm. You just got uh, a lot of old guys doing rock that, thought they should have made it a long time ago and now that they got an inheritance by god they're gonna they're gonna see that everybody was wrong about them and then you've got uh kids coming up that got apps to do everything and um i don't know where the next little richard is going to come from i know that today if um elvis or 
or James Brown or something like that was sitting on a stool beside somebody that had like a million dollars to put in their career and they had nothing, I guarantee you the person with a million dollars would do a lot better than any of these great people that, you know, any, anybody. I mean, it's just the way it's structured now is very, um, is very difficult yet is more accessible. Yes. And, um, and the thing is that where a great manager came in with you and and with others that have managed my career, I've had good managers. I've been very lucky uh, from Jeff Burns, um, head of Sony for 10 years um, to. Uh, well, there's been quite a few, actually, Morris Fulinosi and yourself and uh, Bob Parr and uh, Danny, you know, Danny. <laughs> um you know, and Jeff Keys, it's really great. They make it happen, you know, and all the artists had to do. All I had to do was go home and anybody that had written to video hits or something, I'd be signing autographs to them and writing letters. And also, I got to mention one other person that really helped things go. And it was just a lucky happenstance. A guy named Bruce Crosby um, had a, something called the Just Music video roadshow this is before the much music video roadshow right so i happened to uh run into him in eatons and he said are hey, you paris black and i said yeah i'm paris black and he said well i've got this video roadshow if you want to come and be a you know come in and i'll feature you and you come around with a roadshow so in the course of two years you probably got me to a thousand high schools you know mm -hmm. uh no not, not not two years maybe three years okay. maybe not a thousand but but I was certainly going to 10 high schools a week at least right. with him, wow. you know, mm -hmm. and his crew. And that got me in front of people. And I was starting to get riot scenes happening where people were, you know, screaming like Elvis. And uh, um, it was crazy. Like the stages were falling down. And, um, you know, the record labels obviously saw this. And uh, the, all these kids were writing into the video shows and stuff. And so I, my stuff went on much higher rotation than maybe it even should have had. So, um, you know, again, it was just so many things. And I think performers have to realize this. So many things come down to luck. Right. And your luck will come, but you have it, to notice it. It comes down to take it. comes down to luck, but your talent was there to support it. Right. And well, I, must so, have been, I must have been good enough to support it because I, yeah. I was able to keep going at it. but. Yeah. That that is something, and it it is big, and I mean those having that those excited, interested teens having that footage, yes, it helped. I wouldn't say you went into higher rotation uh, for any other reason than the demand is there. When they see the demand is there, right, exactly, they answer to it. Yeah. So yeah, definitely, exactly, exactly. Like and you can you can scare to... a few people. Just you can say, I mean, unless you. You don't want to, but we, you know, at the time there was money to be made, and well, I... that's the thing. At that time, there was a lot of money to be made. Right. Um, so, so just tell us now. now. Tell us now. Is... A song in high rotation each night would be making. Oh no, I don't really know that because my labels mm. would have known that. Then you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, but yeah. I do know that. Because my songs were on TV, like they were really on video hits a lot. Like right. video hits was really a huge supporter, and much music, of course, was right. Yeah, and, and YTV was a real big supporter. But so, because of that, I was able to tour across the country constantly, and um, constantly be, you know, revving up my fan base. Right. And uh, you know, so that was, you know, again, it's a lot of luck. I mean, it really is luck. Not to say that that um, that you don't have to be good. You got to be great. You got to be as great as you can be. You have to be that because a lot of people are going to be great. Being great is almost almost just a, an obligatory beginning. Um, but you have to see your lucky chances, and you have to work like hell too when you when you see those chances. I mean. I did write letters until the middle of the night and I'd be at DJ stations, you know, at, at six in the morning because um, all these people would write to me and I'd write back. You know, this is another reason they get kids when they're young. 
because you're literally on tour to like, and you're done at two, three, and then you got to be on a uh, on a drive radio show at six. So only people that don't really have to sleep much can really handle that, you know. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I worked my ass off as well, but um, nowadays a kid has their best talent. What's more important than their musical talent or their uh, talent in whatever they do is how well they can market themselves. That, you know, that is a part of, of today. Uh, but there yep. is a, a change. And I mean, anything that's alive will change. So the music industry, it's still alive. Right now, this is what it looks like, where the skills of, of marketing, just getting in someone's face, no matter what kind of talent is behind that initial CD cover or, or their thumbnail, right? But I'm glad that in a time where talent mattered, that you were a big part of it. So, Paris, it's been such a delight having this conversation with you. I'm going to ask if you could please state your website. ParisBlackOfficial.com Thank you. And this ends part one of our conversation with Paris Black. Please keep an eye out for our schedule for part two. Until next time, I'm Eva John for Cool Life Podcast. I'm Paris Black, thanks for having on Cool Life Podcast. And thank you, Paris. And that was our show. Thank you for listening to the very end. Please remember to subscribe through your streaming service to get more access to our guest interviews. Also, please subscribe on YouTube to help support our podcast. Until next time. I'm Eva John for Cool Life Podcast. Thank you for turning me on.